Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the planning committee on the 8th of February. I will just advise everybody that the, this meeting is being live streamed. Um, I'm Councillor Georgette Polly, and I will be chair for this evening. I'd like to remind everyone present that this meeting is being live streamed and recorded for publication on the council's website. Item 9, London Gateway Logistics Park, consideration of habitat regulation assessment for local development order 1.5 has been moved and will be heard before item 8 on the agenda. Just as reference. So... You can't hear me, Steve. All oh, right, sorry. I'll try and speak into the mic. Thank you. So, moving to the agenda, we've got uh, apologies for absence. So, uh, I, I am chairing on behalf of Councillor Kelly and Councillor Russell is subbing for Councillor Kelly. We have no other apologies for minutes. We welcome Councillor Byrne to the planning committee. Councillor Shinnock. Um, we've got a lot of different offices here tonight and I'm not familiar with them. Can I sort of introduce myself before we start? Is that a good idea at all? As you request it, we can introduce the officers. So, at Councillor Shinnett's request, if you could just uh, introduce yourself, please. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Emma Barnett, um, and I'm a planning consultant from Adams Hendry, working for the Council on the London Gateway Local Development Order. Um, good evening, I'm Rachel Morrill. I'm also working for Adams Hendry alongside Emma uh, on the Local Development Order and I'll be presenting the two cases for you today. Uh, good evening, I'm Trevor Faulkner. I arrived at uh, Farrock about four weeks ago, so I'm Interim Head of uh, Planning Delivery, uh, essentially in charge of uh, Development Management Team. Uh, Chris Purvis, Major Applications Manager uh, in Planning. Julian Howes, Principal Engineer, Highways Development Control. Uh, good evening, Daniel Kozelko. I'm a barrister acting as legal representative today. And I believe we know yeah. our committee clerk. So the first two ladies, as, as they've identified, are not actual planning, they're not part of the planning team for Thurrock Council, but they are um, have done an awful lot of background work and uh, delivery on the LDO 1.5, so they're here to answer the questions that uh, members may have. Is, that, is everybody content with that now? Okay, thank you. So, I'll just... We have a full committee, so I know there's no other apologies, so thank you for that. Um, item two on the agenda is the, the minutes. Does anybody have any comments on the minutes from the previous? Okay, so if there's no comments against the minutes, I move that we agree the minutes. Is that seconded? Thank you, Councillor Watson. Agreed. Thank you. Items of urgent business. Um, as chair this evening, I have been advised that we did have a late um, request to speak on, uh, on the last agenda item. Which is uh, application 2300442, Car Parks Crown Road. Um, we... We already had one statement 
in objection. The request has come from the uh, agent for the site. Uh, so in the interest of being fair, I have allowed the agent to speak. But we'll take that as we come to that item. Thank you. So moving to item four on the agenda, that is declaration of interest. Do any members have any pecuniary interest that they need to declare on any items on the council burn? I haven't got any declared interest, but I am a resident of homesteads. I'm a working on the homestead and I'm a councillor for homesteads and this is anything to do with London Gateway, DP World. I live there, but I'm not compromised in any way. I'll just say, make, put that right that I actually a resident in case anybody has any queries on that. Thank you. Councillor Arnold. Uh, well, it, it, just following that up, I might as well, I'm actually a resident SS17 as well. Any other members? I suppose to join the hall, I better <coughs> mention that I'm a member of S uh, resident of SS17 as well. Well, thank you for member. Thank you, members. But as you are aware, they're not pecuniary interests and do not exclude you from this meeting or from any debate or voting on the, the actual application. Um, and that is why we we live in Farrock. We do come across these situations where we are sort of living. We have applications that come up in our own ward. So it's better to declare it than not. So thank you for that. Does any, so agenda item number five is declarations of receipts. Does anyone have any declarations of receipts of receipts of correspondence or any meetings, discussions held relevant to determination of any planning application on, or enforcement action to be resolved on this meeting? I, I will start. I will just say that uh, there was a members' re meet briefing on the LDO 1.5 because it's such a special piece of legislation and not normal to this committee. We, we took the collaborative view that it would be appropriate to have an in-depth briefing before this meeting so that we, we have a better understanding of it. So that's the only declaration that I have that we've had to, um, We've had a special briefing on that item. Any other members? And I will, I will take the opportunity to say thank you to the officers and to the um, agents and to the members that attended that because I do feel that it was a very informative um, meeting. So thank you for that. So moving on now to agenda item number six is the list of our planning appeals. Does any member have any comments or questions regarding our planning appeals? There's no comments on the appeals. That, that report is of note. Thank you. Sorry for the delay, I'm just, I've got a briefing note here and there's something on there I'm not quite sure of. Item seven on the agenda. That's 
No, this is troubling. We've already covered them. Regarding public address to the planning committee, um, we only have speakers on the car park application, so therefore we, we will address that as we get to that application. We will now move on to... We're going to agenda item number nine as we're taking that out of sequence. Thank you. Okay, so this application relates to the consideration of habitat regulation assessment in relation to the local development order 1.5. Um, so a report was presented to the planning committee back on the 21st of September in last year um, and this was to delegate authority to the local planning authority to progress with the preparation of the London Gateway Logistics Park Local Development Order 1.5. Um, Luke, could we move to the plan please? Thank you. Um, so this plan shows the location of the local development order. It's a 220 hectare site. Um, it's on the north bank of the Thames Estuary. Um, four kilometres to, to the west is Stamford La Hope and three kilometres to the northwest is uh, Corringham. So the purpose of a local development order is to provide permitted development rights for specified types of development um, in defined locations to help accelerate delivery. The council, as you're probably aware, made the local development order um, in November 2013. This was the original local development order for Thames Gateway. It permitted up to 829,700 square metres of commercial floor space for the site, of which almost 340,000 square metres um, is either complete or operational or is under construction. The original order, which we now uh, call LDO1, expired in November 2023, um, and therefore we need another consent on the site to enable the delivery of the remainder of the logistics park. So the purpose of LDO 1.5, which is the case you're going to be hearing uh, today, it's intended as an interim measure um, and essentially an extension um, to the LDO 1. Um, the purpose being it would be valid for a year or until LDO2 um, is adopted, whichever is earlier. Um, and it would enable the delivery up to 85,000 square metres of B8 floor space. Um, LDO2 will be the new replacement uh, local development order which will come before members for consideration in the future. Um, before making a decision, however, on whether to make LDO 1.5, the habitats regulations um, regulations require it to be determined if the proposal would have significant effects on the integrity of a European site or a European offshore marine site, either alone or in combination with other plans or projects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we've got here a plan which just shows the site in relation to those designated sites. So we've got the Thames Estuary and Marshes SPA, the Thames Estuary and Marshes Ramsar site, the Benfleet and Southend Marshes SPA, and also the Benfleet and Southend Mar Marshes Ramsar site. So these are the protected sites that need to be considered. Um, as part of this work, a habitat regulations assessment was prepared and has been scrutinised by Natural England. Natural England agree that providing the works uh, in relation to LDO 1.5 are undertaken in strict accordance with the submitted details. They're not likely to have a significant effect on these protected sites. Uh, next slide, please. So just in summary, LDO 1 permitted up to 829,700 square metres of commercial floor space, um, of which 340,000 square metres up to almost, sorry, is either complete or operational. And LDO 1.5 is an interim measure valid for a year or until LDO 2 is adopted. Just to set out here, Regulation 80 of the Conservation and Habitats and Species Regulation must be applied to the making of a local development order. This requires that the Council, as competent authority, decide if a plan or project is likely to have a significant effect on a European site or a European offshore marine site, either alone or in combination with other plans or projects. Uh, next slide. Um, so the habitat regulations assessment, this concluded that with 
avoidance and mitigation measures the development proposed would have a negligible impact on the protected sites and Natural England have agreed with this um, and as such the recommendation that's put before you is uh, that the development proposed by LDA 1.5 is not likely to have a significant effect on a European site or a European offshore marine site either alone or in combination with other projects. And if members agree with this recommendation, we can then move forward with the second uh, case on the agenda, which is to then determine whether you wish to make the LGO 1.5 order. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'll open this uh, part of the agenda up for questions there. Do members have any questions for Rachel? Council Redsaw, is it? Thank you, Rachel. Um, just asking, really, um, it may not affect... Oh, I said it the other night, no question is stupid. We, we need to, um, you know, <laughs> think of everything. Is there any dredging going on at all on the site that goes round? Um, because there was dredging done a few years ago, and that trouble is when you dredge, it, it, it goes away, but then it finds its way back again. So I wonder if there's any dredging going on in that in that area because you have to dredge to you know to make the water do what it's supposed to do. Yeah, no, that's totally fair enough. Um, yeah, not in relation to the local um, London Gateway uh, Logistics Park. Councillor Watson. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel for your presentation and thanks for yesterday by the way it was it was useful and thank you for legal for actually being here well done um, so my bit is about how do we monitor to ensure that this is maintained within the LDO 1.5 and that legally how can we enforce it if we think that it isn't being maintained so I think probably in terms of so this relates to the compliance documents, which were part of our discussion in terms of whether to make LDO 1.5. Um, but there's monitoring information that's presented, which ensures that um, all the requirements in terms of those compliant document, documents are adhered to. And obviously, it's open to the council or other bodies to be able to inspect that if it's required at any point in time as well. And what would be the process if we don't think they are doing exactly what we wanted to do in the monitoring? I mean, I would suggest it's probably the same with any sort of planning, breach of planning control, is that there's the opportunity to be able to take enforcement action and the appropriate routes through the legislation to be able to do that. We haven't got enforcement right now. So because of that, it's a serious question. How are we going to ensure that this is being maintained? Because this is, for me, this is really important. This is just giving somebody... And believe you me, I want DP World to... You know, I'm quite happy. But... Um, I just need to have that confidence that it is going to be staying within the 1.5 because we are giving them clanche blanche to do what they want on a planning without even coming back here. I mean, as with, as with any planning application, I mean, it's essentially through the order, there's, there's conditions and requirements that they'd have to adhere to and there's a legal agreement that they'd have to adhere to and all these documents are, are tied in with the planning decision. Um, I mean, in terms of... I think partly, you know, looking to date as well, DP World to date have always provided their monitoring information as required. Um, and, you know, going forward, obviously, there will continue to be those requirements upon them to need to do that. And you've got the conditions there and the ability to be able to take action if there was obviously um, an issue raised that they weren't complying with. Thank you. Can I just come here? As, as we said with the introductions, um, Rachel and her co colleague are consultants, so I, th I think if we can bring legal in to give you uh, some more reassurance on that, and possibly Tracy as regards council officers. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about who gives me that reassurance. I just need that reassurance, and that's why I would like I, it. I'm just well. suggesting it, Rachel wasn't perhaps the right person for that question to be directed at, so just to, to be sure that you get... The, a, a more fuller answer. Um, I mean, I, what I'm mainly going to say is just to support what has already been said. So um, an LDO essentially operates in a similar manner to, if you think of permitted development rights generally. 
um, and still a breach of planning control for permitted development rights or a local development order is enforced in the same way, which is as a breach of planning control. Now, if there were a breach of planning control in relation to the habitats, um, management of habitats or anything else under the scheme, you could bring enforcement proceedings. Now, I know what you said about the amount of enforcement that's currently been undertaken by the council. Um, if something were to happen, which was a breach and it wasn't immediately enforced against, you could still bring enforcement action down the line. Um, you'll be aware of the limitations that apply to enforcement. It's not that you'd have to immediately jump on it. Um, and in addition, um, when requiring someone to comply with planning control, you can require them to put things as best as they're able back in the position where it was prior. So it may well be that even if you had that issue concerning, well, would you enforce against them today were the worst to happen, you could still have confidence that steps because you don't take steps immediately, you can still, as best as you're able, achieve compliance. Um, I would add as well, the, the requirement to comply would survive um, LDA 1.5 expiring. Um, in any event, I would expect LDA, it, it would be captured by LDO 2, but um, there, there are limits on the carte blanche that they have, and you will be able to enforce against those. Um, hopefully that... Um, gives you a bit more confidence on, on that point. Thank you. Councillor Redsall. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just to pick up what Councillor Watson said, we're all sitting here and know exactly what conditions on planning means. It doesn't always mean that it's followed up. Um, so I think that's where we're worried, but that, that satisfies me a little bit. But we've got to really pick on up, you know, permitted development, it's fine, but when you put conditions in something, not everybody follows up those conditions. So I think we've got, in this thing, we've got to be really, really careful what we're doing. Thank you very much. Just going to bring in uh, Tracy Coleman now, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, <clears throat> reassure you about the monitoring that's done. So effectively, the um, DP World have their own ecologists and they report they will report to, to the council, and those reports, if necessary, will go to Natural England. So they, the, the work that's been done over the last 10 years has been exemplary in relation to um, the mitigation that's needed to be done. In fact, it's so good that, um, you know, there's habitats sort of, you know, forming in areas. So, as I said, they've got their own ecologists and they do take it very seriously. Um, <clears throat> and everything that's laid back has to be reported back in the mitigation because these are environmental issues which weigh far above the planning legislation. So they do have to be sort of dealt with. Just follow up, so thank you. But, um, and, I, and I, that's very, very reassuring because I think that we need to maintain our habitat as much as we possibly can. And having a great big DP world sitting there with this LDO 1.5, and I'm, you know, and I, I'm, thank you for making me feel reassured about the legal side of it. I've got questions on LDO 1, 2, that will be later. Um, but like, I think it, it will be okay. But I just want to know that I don't want any slip ups. So in order to do that, I know they're exemplary, I know they want to carry on forward, that's fantastic, but I still want the monitoring to be put in place quite rigorously to make sure that our green bill is sort of like protected with the habitat as well. Thank you. I think Councillor Lillard, do you add your hand up? Would you? Thanks, Chair. I was just going to say that I, I do know that they have their own planning officers that used to work for Thurrock Council working at DP World, and they are very, very... Um, uh, careful to ensure that uh, their standards are, are the same as ours. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Maney, you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I just wanted to reiterate what Councillor Watson said. I mean, I know this is an area of massive economic development, but that is really important, uh, really important. We need to really monitor that, and that until Councillor Watson mentioned it, that was something I was seeking reassurance on. So, yeah, like her, I am reassured, but we have got to be really, really monitoring it. Thank you. Councillor Byrne, you had your hand up. 
Yes, I'll say DPR World, they attend every forum meeting we have in Stanford, Coringham and Homesteads and they tell you everything. They're very open. They, the bad things like the piling, which annoys everybody, they come and tell you and explain. So have anything, the good and the bad, they tell they're open. They don't hide anything. So they are very open and honest with the residents. So I think we, I've got trust in them that they, if there's anything going wrong, they would actually tell you. Thank you. Um, as we said, the LDO one is, is t at the end of its life last year. H had we had any reports or any um, any issues with any of the? Because um, it's a Ramsay site, isn't it? It's it's it's, it's national heritage. It's international importance. Um, I'm not aware that we've had to take any action in the last 10 years. Would I be correct on that? The answer's come back, I'm correct. So yeah, I think that would give us comfort that um, the, the LDO 1.5 that we'll get to has got a limited life to it as well, but that doesn't mean that this... this um, this is why we've had to move this agenda item in front of it because if we if we don't agree on this then we can't move to 1.5 but um are, are there any more questions regarding this item mr taylor do you have anything to, that you want to ask on that item if not i'll move to debate thanks um Councillor Polly, well, only that obviously it also sits in the middle of the green belt, which is my concern, but given that the site is already there, it, it's kind of already accepted 10, well, 10 more than 10 years ago that it was, it was going to happen anyway. So it's never going to be on the top of my list of things I love, but at the same time, I don't know if I, I understand where it is and therefore uh, and what it is. So there's nothing I need to add, I don't think. Thank you. Are members content with questions? Can I move to debate on this item? Is there any debate? In, in that case, I, I will uh, move the recommendations. Recommendation, note the content of the report to inform a Habitats Regulations Assessment London Gateway Logistics Park Local Development Order 1.5 dated November 2023 and the consultation response is received. 1.2 formally determine on the basis of the information available that the development proposed by the LDO will not adversely affect the integrity of a European or a European offshore marine site, either alone or in combination with other plans or projects. Is that seconded? Councillor Lilliard, are we agreed? Unanimous? Thank you. We now move to agenda item eight. And again, we'll go uh, to Rachel and Emma for a presentation on this report. Thank you. Okay, so this item relates to whether to make the Local Development Order 1.5. Um, so following the ex expiry of LDO1 in November last year, um, as we discussed, another consent is required to enable the delivery of the remainder of the logistics park. Um, so LDO 1.5 is intended as an interim measure, which is essentially as an extension to the LDO 1, um, which expired last year, and valid for one year or until LDO 2 is adopted, whichever ever is earlier. And this is to enable the delivery up to a further 85,000 square metres of B8 floor space pending consideration of LDO 2. Um, next slide. So here we've got the plan which shows the LDO site. So the boundary for LDO 1.5 is similar to that uh, that was there for LDO 1, but it does exclude the land known as the Tongue Land, which is in the southwestern corner of the logistics park, as the infrastructure works have been completed and no further developments proposed in this area. 
Additional land, which is approximately seven hectares, is now included around the former Gateway Energy Centre, which you can see is that sort of hole in the hole to the right-hand side of the site. Um, and this is reflecting the reduced land requirement for the battery energy storage system. Uh, next slide, please, thanks. So we've just set out here just a little bit of the planning history relating to the logistics park, just in terms of some of the floor space, uh, to put it in context. So um, back in May 2007, there was an outline planning consent, which was granted by the Secretary of State. This was for 936,601 square metres of floor space. Then, as we discussed in November 2013, the decision was made uh, to for the... LDO1 uh, local development order, which permitted 829,700 square metres of floor space. As part of that, the mitigation secured three compliance documents and Section 106 agreement for the full amount of the development, uh, much of which has already been completed. So by November last year, 337,225 square metres of floor space has been completed uh, or is under construction or consented, so less than half of that which the LDO originally intended to deliver. Um, then February 2024, which is current to date, uh, LDO 1.5 is now proposed for a further 85,000 square metres of B8 floor space. So this would take, in addition to those works that have already been carried out or are consented, the total amount up to 422,225 square metres. It will include the mitigation not delivered under LDO 1, which would be secured as part of a Section 106 through this LDO 1.5, and the compliance documents, which will continue to secure plot-based mitigation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and then in summer this year, hopefully, we'll have the uh, LDO proposed um, proposal coming before you, which will be for a maximum of 733,766 square metres of floor space on the site, which is obviously less than LDO 1 originally uh, looked to consent and um, far less than the original outline planning permission was for as well. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this plan's quite useful. It just sets out um, on the master plan the development status of the plots that have been developed, those which um, have consent, and indicatively shows those areas where plots could come forward. So in red, we've got um, those developments that are complete. Blue, light blue, is the prior, prior notification where it's been confirmed. Um, and then the grey areas are where development is expected to come in the plots in the future. Um, and a lot of that would be as part of LDO2. Um, next plan, please. Thank you. Um, so the development to be permitted by LDO 1.5 will be subject to conditions and limitations <coughs> which form a schedule, schedules to the order. So there are four compliance documents which give additional detailed controls. So these comprise the design code, and this sets out the standards for plots, infrastructure, and amenity space. The code of construction practice, this sets out a framework for all the site preparation and construction works. The ecological mitigation and management plan, um, which shows the mitigation management um, and monitoring protocols uh, for the site, and a travel plan which includes measures to encourage sustainable transport. There's also the Section 106 agreement, which the heads of terms are on page 423 of the reports pack. Um, sorry, next slide, yep. So in terms of the consultation that's been carried out as part of this, oh sorry, one of the other things to do with the documents, sorry, that I meant to mention was all the op documents are essentially based on the documents from LGO1, but they have been updated and these are to reflect changes in legislation and also to take account of works that have been completed on the site, but essentially they're very similar to those documents that were part of LDO1. Um, so in terms of the consultation, um, we've undertaken quite extensive consultation. Uh, we've received no objections from statutory consultees. In terms of uh, nearby owner occupiers, we sent 484 consultation letters Two objections were received from residents with the main concerns uh, relating to noise and safety associated with traffic and, and in particular heavy goods vehicles. Um, so just in response to that, I mean, the forecast daily trip generation is materially less than that was assessed for LDO1. And the works, including for noise, have been carried out in anticipation of the full LDO1 coming forward. Um, an assessment of the transportation impact suggests that the highway network is capable of accommodating the additional traffic from the LDO 1.5 development without resulting in significant impacts on the environment. We've also included a restriction on the amount of floor space that can be occupied as a high-intensity parcel surface, 
service, sorry. Um, this is sort of uses like UPS, um, which generate higher traffic movements um, than other B8 uses. So by reducing that, obviously, we're going to reduce some of the impacts that this additional floor space could, could have. Um, there's also the additional requirement for occupier travel plans to be submitted for approval by the London Gateway Travel Plan Committee. And this is something that's been requested by National Highways as well. Um, we've always, as you would have seen in the report, carried out an assessment of heritage, ecology and, ecology and flood risk. Um, and it concludes that the impacts of needs are acceptable. So the only other issue to raise as well is following publication of the committee report, we have also received a consultation response from Network Rail um, and they've raised no objections to the proposal. So just in summary, London Gateway is located on a site of the former Shell Haven oil refinery, the redevelopment of which is a long-standing policy aspiration and it remains central to the planning strategies for Thurrock. LG01 has been successful in simplifying the planning consenting regime for the development at the logistics park and it's offered clear commercial benefits to the operator DP World London Gateway and potential occupiers who have been able to proceed with development on site in a relatively short space of time. LGO 1.5 is intended as an interim measure valid for one year or until LGO 2, which is the replacement order, is adopted, whichever is earlier. And this is to enable the delivery of a further 85,000 square metres of B8 floor space pending consideration of LGO 2. LGO 5 will continue to help accelerate the delivery of appropriate development on the remainder of the logistics park, promoting economic, social and environmental gains for the area. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I'll open this up for questions, members. Councillor Arnold. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Um, yeah, really, it's just, I'm kind of curious, obviously, this, this, the LDO 1.5 and obviously moving forward to the LDO 2, um, it's just an obvious question to me, really. I mean, how do we monitor development? Um, Let's just shorten it and just say, you know, it may be uh, developers or, or London Gateway actually pushing the envelope on square meterage for buildings and things. Do we actually check this aerially of boots on the ground? I mean, how, how do we do that? Well, in terms of um, when, a, when an occupier is found to one of the sites, they have to submit a prior notification form. So as part of that process, they have to submit all the plans and documents as to what they're going to be um, proposing on site. Um, and that is then assessed by officers here at Thurrock, Thurrock against the local development order and the compliance documents as well. So it ensures what's being proposed then actually follows what the order um, requires. And then... I think it's probably very similar to the previous question in terms of compliance. Um, it comes back to there's conditions, there's the requirements um, on the operators, we've got the monitoring information, um, and there's the ability, ability to take enforcement action if it's found there's ever a breach of planning control. Um, but one of the things we've found is um, DP London Gateway are very, they monitor it themselves, and if they found that there have been any breaches, they've actually alerted the occupiers to those, and there have been retrospective uh, applications put into um, resolve those um, issues if there has been a breach of planning control anyway so I think there's obviously the operator but there's also being monitored by DP London Gateway and then you've also got Thurrock again reviewing it and checking the decisions and information before them as well. Okay thank you I mean I've, I've just got one other point really I mean it, it's just it's more really just a, a comment really um, I mean as we move closer to LDO2 um, you know, vehicle movement in the area is, is likely to become a major issue. Um, increasingly, it is now. Um, so, I mean, I, I just want to put on record, really, that as we move near the LDO2, you know, we will, everybody will be consulted and, and have their input to, you know, how that is going to impact, you know, the actual the area. Thank you. Sorry, can I just interject? It is LDO 1.5 that we've got in front of us. We cannot be discussing something in the future, although they, they may be related. We, we, it, is the, it is the report and the LDO 1.5 that we are discussing tonight. So if we can just focus on that, please. Um, I've got a number of uh, councillors that wish to speak. So uh, I have Councillor... Bredsell, then Watson, then Byrne. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of questions, really, at the moment. Um, 
the 106 money that's 106 that's in place at the moment when that changes how will that alter um what's in place um and the other one is what councillor arnold said about um stanford bypass is going to be the main um where lorries are, are going to come to so it is going to make a difference on that big roundabout um i just really want to know um how, how, how they expect to monitor that, um, because there is going to be an awful lot. We, as we said the other night, we can't guarantee that we're going to be able to push lorries down there. Um, as long as they've got a place to go, that is an option that enforcement officers have. If they've got a place to offer them, they can go to. But we can't force them to spend that money or, or go there. So I just really want to know, in one place, how they're going to monitor that you know, how they're going to monitor the traffic that will come with that order. Yeah, if, if, if I can answer. Um, on your first point in terms of the Section 106, um, so there will be a new Section 106 which will be attached to LDO 1.5, and that will basically repeat what is in LDO 1, just but, but taking out things that obviously have been completed. It will just acknowledge that they've been done, but anything that's left that is outstanding and still to be completed will, will remain in LDO 1.5. There's nothing that's been removed. It is all exactly the same. So I think you should hopefully you can be reassured by that. Um, in terms of monitoring, um, all I can say is that when LDO 1 was assessed, it was more than double the floor space that's on the site at the moment. And the mitigation that was put in place was to deal with the full quantum of development. So what we're proposing at this stage even with LDO 1.5 in place, it will still only take us probably to half of what was previously assessed as being acceptable. So I think the issue comes more as, as we get further on into the development in terms of the completion of the remainder of the park in terms of mitigation that might be required to, to facilitate that. But at this stage with LDO 1.5, we are well within the, re, the, the re realms of what was being assessed and what was considered to be acceptable. <coughs> and that is by all the statutory consultees as well have found it to be acceptable. Can I come back in, Chair, or do you want me to wait? Okay. Um, yeah, just to... Thank you for that. that that's really um, good. Um, just a state that everybody's got no objection, no, you know, recommendations, nothing, no objection, nothing to anything, no comment or anything. It, it would be... It, it's just something to say that I would like the Water Authority to have have been here just to ask questions. They're never at planning. They never come to anything, so there's no... And I didn't actually... There's not much mention in here about flooding because whatever we do on that site is going to alter the way the water is going to get out, you know, because that... I hate to be, because I'm a bit thing about the water and the river and, and everything else. I spent my life on that river, but I, I think that as anything we put in the way of water is going to look for other ways out, you know, it, it's quite a force, you know, so whatever we put in place to mitigate that, it would be better. And I would just like to have seen something a bit more in there to give me that assurance that we are doing what we can. As I say, Water Authority would have been good to have seen them, you know, because we need to know whatever we're putting in place, because however many buildings we stick up in there is going to make a difference to the water you know, and, and whatever water gets out there, some of that may come back. So I, I would just like to have seen a bit more in there, but thanks for that. Thank you, Councillor Red. So, uh, Councillor Watson, then Councillor Byrne. Thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> I don't really know where to direct this, so I'm, I'm going to look to our legal colleague. What is the legislation changes that's been between 1 and 105? And that, what impact does that have on... 1.5. Yeah, so there we go. Um, my understanding, at least, was the general changes in, in law that have happened applying to all of planning. So there's, um, sorry, my mind's gone blank, but the um, legislation that's introduced in relation to infrastructure in 2015, which made amendments directly to the TCPA 1990. But the actual legislation used here to affect the LDO hasn't really changed. Um, I actually understand what you're primarily directed to is changes in relevant changes in policy. Um, also, things like the 2017 environmental regs replaced the earlier set of environmental regs 
um, but they're all in the standard kind of changes that you've seen in your role as um, a, a, on this committee. There's nothing that's particularly changed about making LDOs themselves, um, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, so um, I, yeah, I, I think there might be something that you could say about policy as well, but yeah, that, that essentially reflects it. This is a similar process to what happened 10 years ago. The other oddity actually just about this system, LDOs are quite rare, and so the government at national level has not made that many changes to the structure of LDOs in the time that they've been able to make them. Um, they were an originally an addition to the TCPA, but there haven't been many changes in them in the period between LDO 1 and LDO 1.5. Okay, thank you. Sorry, for the benefit of the audience outside of this oh, room, TCPA... The Town and Country Planning Act 1990. Thank you. And can I just clarify this, um, a couple of things? So the section 106, that will run concurrent. So whatever, whatever it is, it will just carry on running through into two as well, so that we will eventually get the full amount of the section 106 as the development like builds out. Is that correct? Um, section 106 for LDO 1.5 is, is pretty much will carry on the exact same obligation where they have not been fulfilled under yeah. LDO 1. With LDO 2, it is more than likely they will be the same, but there will be a fresh look at that. And if there are different mitigations that are required to, to, to deal with the issues, they will be reflected in LDO2, the 106 attached to LDO2. Right, that, that's good news. And um, Julian, I'm going to ask you. From, a, um, from the council's perspective, um, Manaway, is it, is it, are you comfortable that this is going to be able to take the level of HGVs that's going through that? not just now, but when this new development on the 1.5 comes through, and then when it's two. Thank you, Chair. I, I think it was already indicated um, that the traffic levels associated with LD1, LDO1 were agreed at the time. I wasn't here at the time, but they were agreed. <coughs> and those within 1.5 sit within those. So. That the, 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 there's not an increase as part of 1.5, if you like. They are still part of one, if you like. It will be reassessed once we get to LDO2, but that will be something different. But for, for 1.5, we didn't have any problems because the, the level of traffic had already been assessed under LDO1 and the appropriate mitigation measures undertaken. Councillor Byrne. Yes, thank you. Um, mitigation through, what, through 106 agreements, can you confirm or have it for us written in stone? The only walls affected within 1.5 are Corringham, Fobbin, Stanfordly Hope and the Homesteads. So, so w w what do you mean exactly in terms of traffic? I'm saying, that, is it... It's not going to go outside them areas, 106 money. Oh, uh, sorry. Are you talking about the, the I'm highways talking immunity a, fund? The, the 106 agreements, is it written in stone? It's only Corringham, Fobbin, Stamfordly Hope and the Homesteads. The, 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 the reference in the heads of terms is for, for the highways immunity fund to be agreed with the council. So the council will be the appropriate body as a local planning authority to determine where that's best spent. But it is to deal with the impacts arising from the development. So... I can't, it's not set in stone, but that is what the intention of the money is for. Uh, Councillor Byrne, if we look at page 49, under 3.58, 3 section 106 legal agreement, in addition to the heads of terms, obligation to implement M25 Junction 30 M mitigation scheme update to reflect current circumstances. So I would suggest that the traffic that goes to the port affects the whole of the borough and, and that part of the section 106 it, it is indicated, if I'm correct, uh, 3.59 for improvements to Junction 30. So I if I understood your question, if you're saying the entirety of the Section 106 for the London DP world remains within SS17, I think the answer to that is no, but I will uh, uh, go to... Trevor, can you...? 
advise on this, please? I think that's the answer. Uh, with regard to paragraph 3.59, clearly uh, monies will go towards uh, Junction 30. Not to say it won't go towards the local waters as well, but uh, that's uh, one of the main drivers. And, and can I just refresh people? This is not a new LDO. This is an extension of an existing LDO. A lot of the, the things that have been raised now are pertinent and need to be asked, but again, will be more more implemented in LDO 2 because that is the new document. You can't this mention LDO 2, sorry, you just said earlier. No, this, this is what I'm saying. So the, no, you, the told, you told them not to mention LDO 2 and you're mentioning yeah, no, LDO this 2. I'm confused. Often, Councillor Byrne. But you, you, you have a laugh. You said don't mention LDO 2 and now you mention LDO 2. And I'm saying some of your questions relate to LDO 2 rather than LDO 1.5. This is an existing section 106. It is not a new 106, Councillor Byrne. Okay, can I carry on? So all the paperwork since 2013 is wrong. This wall's affected. This paperwork's wrong. Corring and Fobb in Stanfordly Oak, and we go on for, I've got 10 years of paperwork that says that this paperwork, so everything in his book is wrong then, yes? Because it doesn't, it says walls affected. So this is not worth the papers written on, is it? Another scoreboard error, which we get used to. We're on questions now. Have any members got any questions, please? Council Maney. Thank you, Chair. Talking on 1.5, I know the manor way um, it it's wouldn't result on an, in an unacceptable impact, but that, that sound barrier is ineffective, am I right in saying? Or it's outdated? Um, will, will that be replaced or, or not? Or is that just a, a nonsense question? Thanks, Chair. Um, there are no proposals to replace any sound barriers as part of LDO 1.5 um, because the mitigation that was put in place for LDO 1, which was for a much greater level of development, this is less than half of what was originally assessed. But as part of LDO 2, we'll be looking at that in more detail. Thank you. We go to our Chief Planning Officer. Um, just, just on the talk, um, discussion regarding the barrier, we do know that during the time of construction, there were quite a few residents that didn't want the barrier. So there was a section, I believe, that the barrier was taken down and residents received payments in kind um, for that. Um, so... That is something that we're looking at for the future, but it isn't relevant to LDO 1.5. That's because the bigger number hasn't been reached, but I just wanted to put that in the mix. It's quite a difficult scenario when you've got some people who want it, some people who don't want it, and some people have taken payments for it, etc. Um, but it is something that we, we have been looking at in detail and it, it will be reported back on when we come back to um, when we come back to you in the future. Thank you, Chair. Apologies for that earlier. I will keep this within the context of the 1.5, although it is very tempting. Obviously, you can pick up. Um, that that, that that, the last question, actually, in your, your reply, actually, you've just thrown a very instant thought in my head. You, you, you say some residents have actually taken money in exchange for not having a barrier. What happens if that property then changes hands and the new owner does? It's way before my time, but I did ask the very same question as you, and I was assured that it's a land charge. So, actually when somebody buys that property again, they'll be buying it at a lower value because there was a land charge on there that actually there's an understanding that the property should be cheaper because of the problems that, that it incurs. 
Oh, that's what you pay your solicitors to find, isn't it? So uh, that's interesting. Councillor Byrne. Yes, uh, might, that'll be an odd question, but they, we planted thousands of trees in them little plastic things, and I, every time I drive past, I, I think they're all dead. So does anybody actually go and have a look and see if they're growing, or we've, we've bent our money on, wasted our money for some gardener to put in trees that don't grow, but do we actually monitor them, or we just hope and pray they're going to grow? For clarity, Councillor Byrne, is that the council planted the trees, or, or is this... Uh, it's a a project by the DP World. I yeah, I, I don't know who. Sorry, Councillor, you're saying we've paid lots of money. I, I don't know who you're referring to. The council paid for the. The, the new bit on the um, A13, the old A13, that's going on. It's, it's not just, a relevant it's a planning chair. question. If you want to take it up with yeah, uh, greening and cleaning any, outside of the knows, planning so committee, just, I think that would be best. Well, the trees were part of planning. Have you got... Right, so we come back to... We had Councillor Redsell and Councillor Watson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just to put Councillor Byrne right, the trees were put in by highways and they are still growing. Um, yeah. Um, and I just really, really want to go back to the 106 money because I think that's what Councillor Byrne was asking, that when the 106 changes, it won't be for ward areas. So if you have something built in your area, that money won't instantly come back to your area. So this will go across Thurrock. So it won't be for just SS17. That money will go across Thurrock. Councillor Watson. Just a really quick question, really. Um, when are we looking at LDO2 coming back into planning, do you think? And are we going to hit that target before the year's out that we will be able to adopt that and get that in place? Um, I would certainly hope so. I mean, the, the current intention is to bring LDO, back, LDO2 back before members in the summer. So we are looking to consult probably April time, do the public consultation, which is a statutory consultation beforehand. So um, I, I'm absolutely confident that we will be in a position to bring it back to you, whether you decide to make it or not, that's another question, but th it will be back before you within a year. Councillor Picklow. Thank you, Chair. I'm not sure whether this question is relevant now or in, uh, when it comes up for uh, LDO2, but should the Lower Thames Crossing go ahead, the plan is to divert all the traffic up the A13 to go round the Manorway roundabout, to go back down to get on the new access road to the port. Has that extra traffic on that roundabout been taken into consideration and will it be taken into consideration when it comes through to the, uh, the development, local development order too? Because that's, that's, that could have a big impact on that roundabout. If you don't mind, I'm going to interject. We're going to go to Chief Planning Officer for, for your response, Councillor Piccolo. Thank you, Chair. Um, so... Just to remind you that this LDO 1.5 is based on LDO 1 and the mitigation that relates to the wider area. Now, the LTC isn't consented and we don't know if it will be consented. And so you can't work on speculation I work very closely on the LTC um, and there are still variables that, that, that there are to come forward. So that is something, unless it's actually consented, that we won't be able to, to look at. But certainly what will happen in the reverse is that what we have consented, the LTC will have to consider that in any mitigation that they have to provide. So in effect, we've come before them 
and the traffic that goes on the road when the LTC, because even if the LTC is consented this year, it doesn't have to be delivered. And as we know, a lot of these schemes may not come forward for many years. So what you wouldn't want to do is to, to make provision for that and then it doesn't come forward. But what you would want is then to consider it the other way round when we've, you know, when we've come along and we've got a consent for it. Yeah, no, thank you. It makes it quite clear now. Does the committee have any more questions at the moment? Is it, then I would... I just wanted to add something to what I said to Councillor Watson about this. Yes, certainly, by means. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Watson, I, I thought I would check what I told you about the legislation, just so I was just beavering away while others have been discussing. Um, I just wanted to correct um, the act I was referring to was the Growth and Infrastructure Act 2013, and that made changes to how the Secretary of State can look at the making of LDOs. Um, that changed, there was then the DMPO, so the Development Management Procedure Order changed in 2015, which is what my colleagues have been referring to about how they've gone through the consultation and things like that. And then I already referred to the 27 changes, the 2017 changes in the environmental regulations, so the EIA regs. So those are the major changes. I don't think it's substantially changing anything for the purposes of going from LDO1 to LDO2. I just wanted to clarify that just in case you, the answer I gave was a bit misleading. Thank you. So I, I have a question and it reverts back to an earlier question from Councillor Redsell regarding the flood risk. Within the report on page 48, we have a 3.53 uh, main risk of flooding to the site is from tidal flooding through a combination of high tide storms. Uh, and located with a flood zone three, which is high probability of flooding. The paragraph underneath it says, as identified on the environment and agency mapping tool, the entirety of the site is located in an area with reduced flood risk. That, that on first reading sounds a little bit of a contrast. Could we just have some detail as to why we've got two different um, weightings on the flood risk please yep that's fine so in terms of the flood risk so initially it's given a rating in terms of which flood zone it's located in so the site is located in flood zone three which is an area with a high probability of flooding however these flood zones don't take into account flood defenses that are in place so then you have to look at a subsequent mapping tool which then determines um, what the actual flood risk is with those um, mitigation measures in place so the presence of those flood defenses so with the flood defenses here and um, the entire area is in an area of reduced risk of flooding um, because of those defenses that are in place Lovely, thank you very much for that. Um, I've also got a question, and unfortunately it's reflecting back on some of the early uh, questions along uh, the lines of DB World being a good neighbour and a good landlord as well, because um, we've had some comments about how do we monitor the building, how, uh, and we've, I think we've been quite clear that that comes under building reg regulation, all, all the standard, it, the, this isn't it doesn't mean that we're giving consent for DP World to be their own planning authority, that, that, if I understand that. Um, on page 388, it is quite a detailed and long report, um, we have occupiers responsibilities. Um, and as this is a, an addendum to LDO 1, um, it mentions about the staff survey and... and first operational use of the building logistics parts during the months of April, acting on behalf that should carry out travel plan monitoring comprising of the following elements. I just wonder, over the 10 years, have we seen those surveys done? Have they been implemented? Are we getting feedback as a council on how that is being monitored? Again, we've got some historic um, data on this site and, and I'm just looking for reassurances that it, they've been compliant up to now and therefore would give us comfort that they're not going to, to break, move away from that going forward. Thank you. 
I mean, that's probably more one for the, the highways officers and the council, but I mean, just to give some reassurance going forward in terms of the prior notification form, we have updated this as well um, with a requirement for, the, um, for it to be confirmed that the occupiers are aware that a travel plan is required, so it's moving it as more an upfront thing, um, that that has to be confirmed before um, they start works on site, essentially. We can go to a uh, highways officer, Julian, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> Uh, one of our transport colleagues and uh, National Highways sit on a travel plan committee that I think meets every six months to m monitor travel plan measures and and how 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 they they're working and whatever it is so that 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 is regularly monitored. Yes, that's very reassuring and the answer I was looking for. So thank you for that. Do we have any more questions on this? Uh, Councillor Redsall. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for bringing up the flooding, because <laughs> I feel like deja vu sometimes. I sat on this 10 years ago, and it's sort of um, <laughs> all coming back again. Um, yeah, they're, they're, those little three paragraphs, which says uh, 3.56, says about to confirm the exact continued use of Thurrock Borough Council strategic flood risk assessment. I mean, you know, published in 2018 you know I hate to say and I hope it ever happens but never happens but if the barrier goes we lose Perfleet, Grays, Tilbury and probably along to Stamford so something neat I know there's an officer now in the council on working on the flood risk so we at least got somebody in position to work on that now but I think we shouldn't take it lightly you know, it, it's, it's, we are changing that waterway a little bit. So we have got to look at the flood risk in depth. Thank you. Councillor Shinnock. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is on pollution levels. Since the first start of the build there, has there been monitoring of the pollution levels at all? Because it's quite concerning when we're getting more traffic in and out of the area. Uh, Councillor Shillick, would we perhaps be directing that at air quality when we were saying pollution rather than... OK, thank you. Just for clarification, though. We're looking at council officers, I think, to to our air quality monitoring. Thank you, Chair. I, I guess it would be someone within our environment environmental team. It wouldn't be part of highways. Yeah. It would appear we can't answer your question, Councillor Shinnick, but I will get no, you... No, it is quite concerning because, you know, uh, the way it's all going... And really I, d I definitely really think that a lot of the questions that have been raised tonight, we do need to capture those and put them to officers in readiness for the LD02. I do think they're very um, pertinent questions. But as, this, as that is the new document, that's going to follow, formulate the next 10 years... We, we are in a little bit, I believe, looking retrospectively at this 1.5. Um, it, it's more enablement than um, a new document, if I understand, if I've understood the process correctly. If we have no more questions, I'd like to open this, um, this matter for debate. Are we happy to open for debate? Would anybody like to start the debate? Councillor Redsell. Sorry to keep coming in. When you've done your presentation on, um, you had the red and the green and, or whatever it was, blue, yeah? You had that grey area. Is that the, wherever the ships come in and, and or whatever, was that coming out into the water or was that still on land that is still there? Do you, I don't know if Luke can bring up the plan again. It might be worth... Um, it's the one with the, the master plan with the buildings in the presentation. Sorry. Yeah. So, at the... So, so 
the red lines are the other roads within the um, within the logistic park, um, and the red buildings are those which are, which have been developed. Um, the blue are the ones coming forward. There's grey buildings just below. Do you mean right down at the bottom? That's that's the dock. Yeah, they're the berths. That's the port. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was done quite a while ago, yeah? Okay. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. That's why I asked about the dredging. Oh, yeah. that, that was in connection with that. It was in connection with the, the, the construction of the port, not, not the logistics part. Yeah. Councillor Watson. Thank you. Um, I actually feel quite reassured about this going forward on the 1.5, especially around the environment and also about the EIA. Um, I'm quite, I think going forward, there's been some really salient points being made by members today, um, tonight, that should be reflected in, a, in two. Um, and look forward to that coming back, to be honest with you. Uh, around the, like the um, pollution control, the climate, I think there needs to be something more put in there, even though on 268 they have got a a um, pollution control um, because I feel really reassured and thank you so much for the legal advice that come through because actually I'm quite risk averse and anything else and it reassured me I'm quite happy to support this um, with the caveat that we actually get two in before 1.5 runs out please thanks any other comments from any other councillors at the moment I'd, I'd just like to sum up. I, I just think there's an awful lot of work gone into this document for effectively what is a stepping stone. I do very much appreciate um, our legal support today because it is a very complex piece of legislation and I would like to thank all officers involved in making sure that the, the committee have been supported on this because I think in planning terms it's, it's probably a once-in-a-lifetime experience for, for most authorities. The fact that we are moving towards a second LDO must be quite unique within the planning world. So obviously we want to set the bench, we want to make sure that we ask the right questions, we want to make sure that we are comforted by um, what will be enablement to allow um, economic development and growth and to support the industry that has invested in Thurrock. So we, we thank DP World for um, being such a good neighbour as we've heard from Councillor Byrne uh, and, uh, and I have heard from other ward councillors yesterday on another matter that, um, that there is a, a committee I believe where residents can engage and this is something we encourage quite often community use agreements and things like that within planning so that we we preempt or we have continued dialogue with, with big neighbours um, so that residents do feel that they have got input and their voices are heard. So uh, I, I, if everybody's satisfied with their questions and if everybody's happy with the level of debate, I'd like to move on this uh, application. Is everyone content? Oh, right. Can I go to Councillor Byrne first and I'll come back to you, Councillor Edsel. Oh, did you, did you put your hand up to, was you voting? <laughs> oh, sorry. I haven't moved the motion yet, Councillor Byrne. <laughs> right, no, I, I, I understand you're preoccupied and you've got some personal issues, so I do understand, thank you. Councillor Redsaw, are you... Yeah, ju just, oh. have you, did you query when, you've, when you sent 428 or 458, was it? I haven't got the right figure in front of me now, but, and you only got two responses back. Did you not, not wonder why there was only two? It doesn't seem, I think Councillor Piccolo picked it up a little while ago. It I mean, just seems that you've we've had, Yeah, we've had a list of all the um, consult who was consulted and there's been a full list and the fact that you've received two responses back obviously suggests they've, they've been received. So, um, I mean, that's the information that we've got and they're the responses and they're the ones published on, on your website. So. so even though you had two against, did the people who were sent letters out to, did they not put anything on there at all? There's no other comments have been received from residents, no. 
I, I think that can only be indicative of them being such a good neighbour because they've got continued dialogue with the residents that um, that perhaps issues are being dealt with. I can only make that assumption because something this big. And just on that, the 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 two comments of complaint were to do with speed of vehicles rather than traffic movements or quantity of movements. And I am aware now that the the uh, camera is now in action so hopefully that will help deal with some of the issues um, I, and I think that is a testament to to DP world that I, on a on a quite extensive consultation um, did we only had two responses so this time I'm going to try and move for the recommendations is everybody happy for that everyone content So, recommendations as per the report 1.1. Note the council's earlier decision that the development to be authorised by London Gateway Lilistic Park Local Development Order 1.5 will not adversely affect the integrity of the European site, offshore marine site, either alone or in combination with other plans agreed to make LDO 1.5 subject to the signing of Section 106 agreement and note requirement of Council to advise the Secretary of State of the LDO 1.5 made. Please, would you? Of course, and um, I, I mean, others can chip in as well. Um, so there are various protections that arise out of various different um, uh, recognitions that originally arised out of the EU. So we have things like Ramsar sites, things like Triple SIs, which are sites of specific scientific interest. Um, sorry, yes, bit of a mouthful. Um, there are others which are recognised um, internationally through conventions. Um, we manage them in the UK by essentially grouping them all together under one set of um, regulations to um, protect them using essentially the same types of protections. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, essentially, there's a long list of different things. But they all come through the same way, which is matching our international obligations through various routes, through our own uh, domestic law. Um, I don't know if it's useful for me to go through them individually and where they actually come from, but hopefully that gives you a bit of a, yeah, a high-level summary of what they do. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you for that. I just think there's other people on here who don't understand what that means, so just the clarity yeah. was good. Thank you for that. Of course. And again, just for the point of clarity, that was the that was the recommendation that we've already taken on item nine. So that was in relation to that report. So uh, j just to note that we had already taken that report. Councillor Manny, did you want to come? Oh, sorry. Okay. So again. Do I, need, I don't need to read them again. We'll just, just go to recommendation 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3. Uh, do I have a seconder for that, Councillor Mayne? Uh, oh, are we in agreement? Is that unanimous? Agreed. Thank you. Oh. Uh, I would now, before we go to the next item, and I thank you for the people in the gallery that have been really patient, I just would like to go to our Chief Planning Officer who would like to come in at this point. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say to um, members of the Planning Committee that um, there's a lot of things that people say are wrong with her, but one thing that you should be really proud of, and that is when this was put in place 10 years ago, this was absolutely cutting edge. And these are some of the largest LDOs in the whole country. And it's been managed and delivered in an impeccable way. 
And I think moving forward, there's a lot of people. I, I, I belong to a group which is all the new free ports. And they're looking at what Thorough are doing and have done in the past and looking to us how to do things for the future. So I think that this, this is something this council should be proud of, that they you know, were sort of forward thinking through this process and have brought it forward in, in, a, in a really good way. And I just wanted to make that on record because I think it's really important that sometimes we actually sing our own praises. Thank you very much. And I just would like to add my comments in that we, you know, our planning department has been exemplary and all the groundwork that has gone in before with Matt Gallagher and other officers such as our highways and that, and then for the um, Rachel and Emma then to pick this up to get us where we are. We've still got a lot of work going forward and I think, you know, given our current situation, uh, with the section 114 it is really encouraging that we still have um, we still have industry committed to thorough camel that we can still be looking forward and looking for growth so I, I do think that um, we've, we've got a lot to thank our officers for and there is by the size of this report if this is 1.5 with trepidation <laughs> I can't imagine how many pages there will be in LD05. Uh, perhaps not quite as... Uh, five! <laughs> sorry, LD02, sorry. Uh, perhaps that was a, a, a little... <laughs> a slip of the tongue there. So, on that note, um, thank you for everybody's input and effort. And uh, we... Uh, so, officers that are not... Uh, the consultants can leave the, the meeting now because the next subject doesn't relate to them. Thank you very much. Um, just as an aside, I will, if with the committee's um, agreement, go through with our clerk and capture some of the comments that have been made and put them into a document that will circulate to the planning committee and then perhaps we can put that forward to, to the officers that are working on LDO too. Would that be agreed by the committee? Thank you. Because I think there were absolutely some very pertinent points made. Thank you. Also, as regards other issues, we do have consultations out there regarding the local development plan and area plans, so uh, some of those comments can be fed into them, and I would urge members, we, we get, because we, we have discussions and we, we see different briefings, sometimes we need to remember we, we're residents too and we need to put our comments on as well, so I would just encourage... Uh, all members to to do that. Thank you. So we're now moving on to our next item, agenda item number 10. As I said at the beginning of the meeting, we do have two speakers uh, for this, um, this item. And I'll just go to Luke so that he can advise the speakers and the committee what the process is for speaking. Thank you. I, I do apologise. Um, I've, I've just had an update that um, our objector, the, the resident, isn't present 
uh, in the gallery and has requested that we read out their statement. So what, what I'll do is I'll take the report, we'll ask their questions and then we'll have, we'll, we'll have the report read out uh, from the objector and then we'll uh, take the presentation from the agent. Is everybody in agreement with that? Okay. So, agenda item number 10, uh, planning application 2300442, full uh, car parts, Crown Road, Darnley. And if we can go to Chris Purvis to pre present the report, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. It's only half showing. Thank you, Chairman. Slight technical error. Uh, should flick through. Yes. Do you need me to continue or do you want me to wait? Can I go to the committee? Does anybody need a comfort break at this moment? Uh, I will just suspend the committee for a few minutes just to allow members to take a comfort break. Thank you. Officers too. <laughs>
Do we have everyone back in the room? Are we ready to resume? Councillor Lydiard, would you? Are we ready to continue? <coughs> with? Thank you. Luke, are we back live streaming? Yeah. Thank you. So, agenda item number 10. Uh, I was about to ask Chris Purvis to present the report, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, this is a platform planning application for the erection of a part five, part four, part three storey building to occupy the existing Crown Road car park and permission is also sought for a separate two storey building to occupy the northern end of Darnley Road car park. The Crown Road part of the land would provide 51 apartments split over four internal levels with 20 of the units being for affordable housing, uh, the rest market housing and the Darnley Road part of the development would provide two apartments split over two internal levels at the northern end of the car park. The proposal also includes associated parking, landscaping, amenity areas, access infrastructure and refuse and recycles, uh, refuse stores and cycles, bike stores. So this is the uh, location plan. The site is approximately 0.61 hectares, comprised of the Crown Road car park and the Darnley Road car park, as well as the road to the, uh, the west of the Darnley Road car park and a, and a space under the existing Derby Road Bridge where there's, other, where there's further parking. Uh, also, the uh, area to the north, east to south um, is residential. Uh, directly to the south is the railway line, to the south of Crown Road, that is. Um, to the west is the, the main part of Grays Town Centre, and this site sits within the town centre area in terms of the inset map and the borough local plan. Uh, some slides to show uh, what the site looks like at present. So you've got an aerial photo there uh, to show this, the site and the surroundings. And you've got a couple of 3D images. That's looking north. And that's looking southeast, roughly from the multi-storey car park looking southeast. Crown Road, um, on the southern side of the Crown Road, looking towards the site, so looking north and towards the... Uh, eastern boundary uh, and that's from Stanley Road again looking into the site so you're looking into the west area there in terms of the uh, top two photos and north in terms of Stanley Road uh, as it leads up to the traffic lights. Darnley Road part of the site um, so you've got the part of the car park there and the proposed building as you'll see in a moment is uh, proposed next to the end terrace building there shown in the um, next to the car park. Uh, from the top picture there is taken from Darby Road Bridge looking towards the Darnley Road car park and the buildings in Darnley Road there and the one to the uh, the bottom is the um, Crown Road car park again taken from Darnley Road Bridge. This is the uh, proposed site plan or block plan. It shows the proposed development with a larger building occupying the Crown Road car park. Uh, and an associated amenity space, uh, which is centrally located and directly located behind the uh, the buildings, or building rather. Um, the proposal at the northern end of Darnley Road car park is also shown there. Um, obviously, that's losing some part of Darnley Road car park to do that, um, but that shows the building there in terms of its layout and uh, relationship with the neighbouring terrace buildings in Darnley Road. Associated with the proposed development would be three on-street car parking spaces. I think you can just make them out there to the west of, on Darnley Road and uh, a disabled space within Darnley Road car park. So this is zoomed in just on the uh, Crown Road part of the development. Uh, appreciate it difficult to see the internal arrangements, but there are all the flats that are shown there. You've got a bin store directly to the north of the boundary there. There are other bin stores located around as well. Uh, there's a lay-by area there for servicing and refuge lorries. But what this will create here, which isn't there at present, is a pedestrian route around the front of the site uh, and uh, increasing and uh, improving the visual side of things in terms of landscaping with trees shown to be planted as well there and within this amenity area. So far more in landscaping, which also has biodiversity benefits as well. 
um, compared to the site as an existing surface level car park. Of now I have a series of um, floor plans. Um, so that's the ground floor plan. Again, a bit more zoomed in compared to the previous one. That's the first floor plan. Second floor. A third floor. So you can s see where the tops of buildings are, those grey area, gray areas. So some areas project higher than others. You'll see that in the elevation plans as well in a moment. And that's the fourth floor. So the highest part of the building, uh, which is the fifth storey, if you like, uh, is nearest Derby Road Bridge. Um, and it's liberally designed like that because of the height difference in terms of Derby Road Bridge and furthest away from the two-storey terrace houses that are uh, further just outside of the site. So here's the, some elevations. Um, the top one is taken from, uh, if you like, from Crown Road. It's more of a section drawing as well because you've got the section of the bridge there and the section of the multi-storey car park but it does show you uh, the front or principal, one of the principal elevations, you could be argued to be two here for this Crown Road development. Um, the other being the, the, uh, the one on the bottom picture, which is the east elevation of the building. And then as you can see, it does step down uh, towards the uh, residential properties uh, as shown. That's the western elevation. Bottom one uh, is probably a clearer one. You can also see the Darnley Road development, uh, but the top one, if you were the other side of the bridge, obviously the bridge cuts through the visual uh, image of, of that uh, in terms of that and that's a detail uh, from an architectural drawing that's within the application just to give you uh, an idea of how the balconies are proposed and the detailing on the brickwork um, and coping stones so that's uh, gives you an idea of that and that's also to reflect sort of the bay window arrangements that are in the character of, of, of the area uh, a lot of properties down here in terms of terrace houses have Bay windows, obviously not quite the size of that, but that's just to reflect that in terms of the architectural style. So looking northwest towards the site, uh, this is sort of a before shot, and this is what it would look afterwards uh, if planning permission is granted and, and the development is built out. So it's, it's different there. You'd lose the access into the car park there, obviously, because there's no need for a car, there won't be a car park there anymore. Uh, and the road was still showing the roundabout, there is still three junctions in effect coming off the roundabout, obviously where this one's taken as well. Uh, from Derby Road Bridge, that's another visual to see, to show how the, um, the building would look in the context of its surroundings. Moving to the Darnley Road part of development, so it's the northern end of the car park. You can see a bit clearer there, the uh, parking spaces, the three on-street ones, two allocated for a car club, uh, one for disabled space. And there's disabled space as well within Darnley Road car park, as well as the retained 16 existing spaces in Darnley Road car park. So this is... Um, uh, one flat on the ground floor and one on the first floor, so that's the ground floor plan. And that's the first floor plan. Um, and there's an image looking southeast from street level uh, of before, and hopefully we've got one of afterwards if planning permission is granted and the uh, site developed, it would appear um, to be, it would appear like this. You can also see the Crown Road part of development in the background too give you an idea of the context of, from a street scene relationships perspective. There is a very detailed landscape strategy provided this application to help emphasize and show the greenery of the site and compared to existing. Um, there's a detailed, um, I'll talk about the amenity space in there, but there's also a detailed play space. Uh, so families can live in these, these properties. Um, there are a lot of two bedroom properties um, so potentially families could live here and obviously have the benefit of that play space for the young children. Um, and obviously I mentioned the greenery in terms of the site and the, and the street scene to improvements compared to ex existing visual appearance. And that's, again, an image of how it could look <laughs> when fully developed, obviously a bit of, over a bit of time before those trees get to that sort of height, but that gives you an idea of uh, the, the ideas in terms of landscape strategy uh, that the, uh, the architects and developers are, would be looking to uh, achieve from this. Um, obviously touch on the car parking, um, just, just to give an idea of, again, of those spaces. So these, you've got the three on street ones, the green ones there, the retained ones in Darnley Road car park, the blues, that disabled space, and you've got the service area down here on the uh, eastern side of the east elevation of the building in the street. So just to summarize the development, um, so the project development would provide 53 apartments on site, making better use of urban land in this edge of town centre location, 
and the introduction of residential development in the town centre has been a long term vision of the council and is identified through the various studies that have been produced since the current local plan was adopted. The Grace Town Centre framework in 2017 and the more recent Grace Town Centre study in 2023 both help provide useful guidance to this, but both are evidence based documents rather than planning policy, just so you're aware of that. However, the MPPF as national policy does encourage residential development within town centres to supplement existing town centre uses and encourages reuse of brownfield land. So this approach does accord with those aspects of the national planning policy and therefore the principal development is considered acceptable. The 53 apartments would contribute to the council's housing land supply. The proposal would create a high quality energy efficient design development with the benefit of dedicated communal amenity space in the centre of the development with improved landscaping and biodiversity opportunities. Obviously one of the key aspects of, and considerations of this application is the loss of all of Crown Road car park and part of Darnley Road car park. Um, that's about 108 spaces in total. But the evidence suggests that has been submitted with the application from the um, highway consultants that from parking survey work as detailed in the report that not all the car park is used and not all the streets are used to their capacity at present. Um, this is obviously something we've, we've looked at very carefully uh, through the planning application uh, and the council's highways officer has considered that carefully and in light of what PMD 8 um, paragraph 2 says which does allow for um, less parking in town centre uses like this, town centre sites like this. There is a mitigation package that is required from the council's highways authority uh, and that would be secured for a number of planning conditions and also through section 106 contributions which includes upgrades to the existing control parking zone to make this 24 hours rather than what it is at present which is 9 till 6 uh, Monday to Saturday. Provision of car club spaces um, and a scheme for that improvements to the current parking arrangements under Derby Road Bridge. Um, they would all be subject to financial contributions to the council and for the applicant in to enter into a 278 agreement. Also within the recommendation of the report are further planning conditions on all material planning considerations, as well as a number of other planning obligations. The standard ones you sort of see in terms of achieving 35% at least affordable housing, um, healthcare contribution, You've got the Essex Rams contribution, which is also required in, from an ecology perspective, um, and the education contribution is in there as well as a monitoring fee as well. The recommendation to this planning committee is to grant planning permission as detailed in the recommendation section of the report. Thank you very much, Mr Purvis. Um, as I did say at the earlier opening of the committee, we do have two speakers. Um, as the statement from the objector from local resident isn't present, I will read out the address to the committee. So this has come from a Mr Baker, a local resident, and I believe all members have a copy of it in front of them. The property I own, Mr Baker owns, is 81 Stanley Road, opposite the car park. I have no objection in principle to the erection of flats on the car park. However, the issue of car parking, or more to the point, lack of car parking, is likely to have a detrimental effect on my property. It would be beneficial to all the properties if some public car park spaces were made available to accommodate visitors to the properties 79, 81 and 83 um, as mentioned in his letter, as the only available parking space at present is the Crown Road car park. This is due to the residents only parking on the street not being available to those properties due to the roundabout at Stanley Road and Crown Road. A lack of public parking would make life very difficult for callers to those addresses in Stanley Road. Consideration should also be given to loading, unloading of removal lorries and delivery trucks, particularly with rego regard to road safety. That is the end of the statement from the resident. We also have a, a speaker from the agent in support of the committee, um, in support of the application, apologies. Um, and we'll go 
to the speaker to read out his address. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, my name is uh, Jake Farmer. I'm an associate planner at DLP Planning, uh, acting on behalf of Thurrock Council's uh, housing development team um, in, in supporting this planning application. The applicants have been working closely uh, with the council's pl uh, planning officers to develop the best solution uh, for the site. The applicant has worked proactively with the planning team, particularly with regards to design and transport matters. Uh, the applicants have also engaged proactively with the local community um, by going through two full public consultation processes whose uh, comments have been fed into uh, and are reflected within the design of the scheme. Uh, the development will provide 53 new self-contained flats uh, to, the new, uh, to the local housing market, responding to Thurrock's demonstrable need to deliver housing, uh, as reflected in the critically low five-year housing land supply figures. The, the scheme will deliver 20 affordable housing units, 15 via the affordable rent scheme, and five via the shared ownership scheme, uh, which will again aid in uh, tackling Thurrock's affordable housing crisis. The scheme also delivers a policy, uh, the policy objective that development should be directed to sustainable town centre locations, as such as the Darnley Road, Crown Road car parking site. Uh, the mix of one and two bedroom units seeks to target the varied demographic uh, that we have in the t uh, town centre location, uh, like Grays. The proposal seeks to address the demonstrable need for affordable housing within Thurrock, with the scheme offering 37.7% of the proposed units for affordable housing, uh, exceeding policy requirements of 35%. Uh, in order to assist, again, in order to assist in tackling the housing crisis. Given this town centre location, the site is prime opportunity to propose development with reduced level of car parking in a location that is well served by shopping, leisure, and transport facilities. The need to reduce reliance on cars results in the need to promote sustainable travel and indeed reduce carbon emissions in response to the nationally declared climate emergency. Uh, it's important to note that Thurrock's vision for the borough, uh, as specified within their transport strategy, uh, seeks to build pride, responsibility, and respect, create, uh, respect to create safer communities, uh, improve health and well-being, and protect and promote our clean and green environment. The reduction on the reliance of vehicle usage, uh, particularly within these sustainable uh, town centre locations, um, that's, uh, such as the application site, is key to achieving this vision. Uh, in policy terms, I refer to policy CSTP 14, uh, which states that the council will deliver at least 10% uh, reduction uh, in car traffic in urban areas, such as the application site, and sets out how the council will seek to achieve this. Um, further, to promote active transport measures, 53 covered uh, and convenient long-stay uh, cycle parking facilities will, will be provided to residents uh, in the communal amenity area. Uh, in addition, 54 visitor cycle uh, parking spaces will also be provided. The design reinforces a fabric-first approach in ensuring that the buildings are well insulated and are able to perform well in terms of energy efficiency uh, through the integration of low carbon heating and ventilation systems, SUDS design, uh, SUDS design features, and in terms of biodiversity enhancements of the site. In design terms, the applicant has worked proactively with the council's planning officers to propose a high quality development that provides policy, uh, provides policy and national standards compliant living spaces, landscaped outdoor amenity areas, private amenity spaces, and associated facilities. The proposed design incorporates measures to demonstrate compliance with policy PMD 13 uh, in ensuring that at least 20% of the energy to be used on site is sourced via renewable energy sources. The applicant has sought to create a visually impressive development through the careful articulation of elevations and in integration of high quality landscaping. The proposed design will, create a, uh, will result in a positive impact in creating new active street frontages a new public routes and pavements throughout the site, new public realm landscaping and addressing, the, and addressing the scale of the Derby Road Bridge, which currently dominates the area visually. The proposed design is derived from references to the existing architectural features found within the surroundings of the site, uh, such as the proposed balconies fronting Crown Road 
and, and indeed Stanley Road, uh, which have been designed with reference to the bay windows, as Chris mentioned, um, of the surrounding houses. So in summary, the proposal should be uh, approved uh, because it, can it seeks to deliver a high quality development if by, uh, by providing additional 53 new homes, 37.7% of which will be genuinely affordable housing in a location that is highly successful. Um, therefore, reducing the car dependency and in turn minimizing carbon emissions, which is in line with both national and local policy direction, is therefore concluded that the proposed development is acceptable in both planning and design terms. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much for your address. Do the members have any questions directly in relation to that address before I open it up to officers? Yeah, yeah. Councillor Watson, question of clarity, please. Thank you. Can you just clarify for me um, that the applicant is actually Southwark Council Housing that is doing this? And is this coming HRA or is this coming general fund? And it is important, even though this is planning. Go to Mr. Purvis. I, I can answer the, question, the first question in terms of uh, the applicant is the council's housing team. I can't answer the second question, and there's no one from housing here to, unless um, somebody else can answer the question so in that respect. Can I just clarify then? Are we here? to go through the planning application to give authorisation for Thurrock to build or for us to seek planning application to sell that, that on as with planning application in place for a developer? When the application was submitted and certainly discussed in PREP, it was the council's intention as the housing team, as I understand it, to develop the site at that point in time. But in more recent months, I have been informed this site is on the um, ass assets disposals list. So is it a site that is being looked at to be sold in the future? Nevertheless, we've still got a planning application before us that we need to determine, uh, and the planning permission goes with the land uh, if, if, we if we decide to grant planning permission. This is, this is just coming, like, I did read it. I didn't, to be honest, I read the application itself. I didn't really grasp the fact that it was actual Thurrock Council that was doing that. So, I, I just want, I, I'm really unsure where we stand here. Because if we, we go ahead and go, yeah, you know what, fine, build it. But we may not get what we want. What we're going to do is just part, and we may sell it on with just a, there's a plan application in force, not necessarily what this scheme is, that's one. And secondly, where, has this even been into scrutiny or anywhere like that to be agreed in the beginning that we can go ahead and do this? Because I'm just, I'm just a little bit lost here that, you know, they're not, they're, they're affordable homes. So are we talking about local, local housing allowance affordable homes? Are we talking about social housing affordable homes? The council can't effectively sell sell a property unless it's got a vehicle to sell it through and um I, I just i'm not really comfortable until i get some clarity around those questions to make a decision on this application sorry councillor watson we'll come to legal on advice for that but i don't uh, there's lots of let, let's get you some answers and but the application before us, it does say that the applicant is for council, and at the moment that land is in council ownership. So as, as regards who's going to develop those properties, it's not usually a planning committee consideration. My consideration is I'm not going to be considering this because... I, d I don't know anything about the background sitting behind that. If this was a developer coming forward, I, I'm quite happy to do this, but I, don't, I didn't even know this was really going to that. Uh, can we adjourn so for, can we adjourn for a few clarity. minutes? Yeah, so to, before to I go ahead, I'm not... Sorry, Chair, I'm, I'm not going to be... Until I get clarity around this, I'm not going to take part in any of this. We're just going to adjourn so that we can, and if we can take us offline, Luke, while we get some clarity, because if, you, if you're going to uh, abstain or, or remove yourself from the committee, we need to, to get that um, 
clarified. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we, we had to take some time out to take some uh, advice for the committee to reassure them. I realise that it is now quarter past eight and I need to ask the committee if we can extend standing orders just to address this final piece of business of the committee. Is that agreed? Right. Regarding... Um, Regarding agenda item 10, some technical issues have been raised uh, as a result of this report that we, for re various reasons, are unable to answer to the committee's satisfaction tonight. So on that basis, I am deferring this application until all members of the committee have had a uh, response to their questions. Uh, is that in agreement with the committee? Agreed. Uh, unanimous. Thank you. So on that uh, on that matter, we will defer the application for uh, another hearing, and we will obviously be in contact with um, the agent uh, and, and notify them when that may be. So I thank everybody for their time tonight. Sorry to the uh, speaker for uh, keeping him. A, a really exciting meeting. <laughs> and, I, and I thank you for the committee and one of the things that we always do welcome is, is committee um, input and we, we are very pleased that we've been able to find a resolution that satisfies everybody tonight so thank you for that.